assuming that we've prepared the data now, it's finally time to select an algorithm and build a machine learning model. And once we've built the model, we can start evaluating the performance of the model as well. So to ground ourselves again in the life cycle, this is where we are now. We had a look at the data preparation. Yesterday we had a look at the exploratory data analysis and some of the sampling issues that can arise. And now it's finally time to select an algorithm and build a model. And to remind ourselves again, the selection will ultimately come down to which type of machine learning problem that we want to solve. And we have here the main types of regression, classification and clustering. And you can see here again the list of all the different algorithms that we can actually choose from. And in fact, that list is much larger. So what are some of the considerations or the questions that we should ask ourselves when it comes to algorithm selection? Well, different requirements that we can have can be solved with different algorithmic approaches. It will all come down to how frequently do we need to generate predictions? How quickly do we need to generate predictions? There are certain use cases where you need to classify in a second. Sometimes it's okay to take a minute to perform a classification or get a regression value. And it will also depend on how much training data is available, the distribution, the underlying distribution of the data itself, and the amount of explanations or explainability that I need to perform for the model. So how transparent can I be with the ingredients of the model? Or does it need to be something that is not immediately obvious? And this is what ultimately brings us to something that I briefly want to talk about here, where not all models are actually easy to explain. So the range that we have here is going from linear regression to neural networks, where a linear regression, we've actually seen this as the algorithm example, it's a combination addition of all the individual features that we have in our data set with the weight or parameter factor in front of it. And you can actually explain the coefficients directly. So it is possible to interpret each of the coefficients, each of the weights directly. However, when it comes to something like neural nets, which is composed of hundreds or even thousands of linear regressions with additional functions to pass on the information between the layers of the neural nets, well, then it's no longer possible to directly explain what is going on. And we usually require an additional explainer method or a deeper analysis to generate explanations. And I also want to call out that in certain settings, there is a bit of a trade-off that we might have to consider between accuracy and the interpretability or ability to explain the model outcomes. So performant models such as neural networks, they are going to be a lot harder to analyze and explain versus a linear regression, which we've already seen in our algorithm example. So it will come down to your use case and how much interpretation of the results you need to do or need to deliver and then that ultimately informs the choice of algorithm. We're going to have a look at explainability again on the final lecture day and there will be a deep dive on explainability. So we'll have a look at what it means to be explainable on the final lecture day. But just to illustrate a little bit what's going on here, when we say neural networks, they are a lot harder to explain than linear regressions. We have an artificial neuron here on this slide. And you can see here the inputs going into the neural network are the individual features. So you have feature X1 and X2. And this is an example where there's only one row of features. And each of the features has associated a weight. So we actually already know that notation. That's what gives us the linear regression. So in the blue bubble in the center, you now have the combination, the addition of all the weights and the features in the big summation or sigma. So how does that differ? How does the linear regression differ from a neural network? Well, the only thing that changes really is that we have a so-called activation function that is going to be wrapped around the linear regression. And this activation function can take many different forms. It's a nonlinear activation function example that we have here of a sigmoid, but it could also be a ReLU or Tang H. So many different activation functions, and this will ultimately depend on the architecture and what it is that we're trying to model. 
So really, the artificial neuron in its simplest form is a linear regression, which we already know how it works, so how to compose it, combined with the activation function, which will shape the output and either turn it into a binary yes-no or into a regression or continuous numerical value. So how do we go from one neuron to a neural net? Well, we combine multiple of these artificial neurons that we've seen on the previous slide, and this is what brings us to the multi-layer perceptron, which is the simplest form of a neural network. So what you can see here is now, instead of having one of these neurons, we have multiple of them stacked, and we pass the information from what is called one layer to the next. We have the input layer, which is going to be our features, and then we have the hidden layers, which are going to be our neurons, and then we have the output layer at the very end. And we can actually combine as many neurons as we want and stack them as deep as we need as well. And as we can see here, each layer is connected to the next layer, so there's no connections that are getting lost in between the layers. And the activation functions, they need to match within the layer, but we can use different activation functions for different layers. And for more details, you actually have a link here, and I can refer you to the D2L AI online textbook.